Good morning, Kensington. You made it. So good to see you guys. Welcome to those of you joining us online. Hey, listen, last week was an awesome celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, wasn't it? Wonderful time together. Today, yeah. Today is really a continuation of that celebration as we talk about when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and filled the early church. We're gonna celebrate the Holy Spirit today. And you know what? This is a scripture I love. In the scriptures it says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is joy. So we're gonna celebrate that today. Can we get on our feet this morning? Can you guys help us out by putting your hands together a little bit here? Let's just celebrate. Here we go. Two, three. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging seas, my God, he holds the victory. supposed to have you guys greet one another. So stay standing. <laughs> Sorry. Take a minute and say hi to somebody next to you before you see.
Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you guys all doing? Fantastic. I hope the weather is helping that mood a little bit today. It's amazing to be in short sleeves finally. And just by a quick show of hands, how many of you actually mowed your lawn yesterday? Anyone actually do that? A handful of people who are very, very proud of their landscaping. And so congratulations to you all. Anyways, I want to say welcome to everyone here in the room. Welcome to all of you who are joining us via stream. Hopefully you are watching from a place that is very, very warm. And just as we just heard in this song, there is a lot of joy in the house of the Lord. There's a ton of joy today, and probably the weather contributes a lot to that. But a few things, because we are starting a brand new series today called Beginnings. But before I tell you more about that, I want to let you know about some important things that are going to be happening in the very near future. And the first thing is happening next weekend. It's one of my favorite weekends of the year, and that is Baptism Sunday. And what we believe here at Kensington about baptism is that baptism really is a public declaration of the fact that we are a follower of Jesus. And so there's nothing magical that happens in the water, but rather it's an external symbol of an internal reality that Jesus has completely transformed our lives. And even this past week, I was thinking about when I got baptized when I was 14, and it really was a powerful, powerful moment being able to share that with friends and family and people who have been on the journey with me. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus, and you have never experienced that, we would love for you to take that step next week with us. And for more information to register, all you have to do is go to our website, you can go to our app, or for those of us here in the room, just go out to the lobby and drop by a place that we call the hub. You'll see people with bright orange shirts on, and they will be able to answer any questions and help you out with that as well. And when we came here today, for those of us here in the room, you probably noticed, because it's hard not to, that our parking lot, one of our parking lots is actually being redone. And so we are really, I personally am very excited about it because in four to six weeks, what it means is is that when you drive into that parking lot, you won't feel like you're off-roading anymore. And so that is an amazing, amazing thing. But like I said, it's going to take about four to six weeks. And so if you're here during the week, if you're here on a Sunday, just we want to invite you to plan accordingly. Just come a couple minutes early. So if you need to check in your kids or do anything, grab a cup of coffee, that you can do that as well. But we are very thankful that that is being done. And also... That was something that's actually happening right now in the chat room, which is a room right out in the lobby, is something that we call Bible Basics. And it really is for anybody who has any type of questions or interest in the Bible. And it doesn't matter whether you've never read the Bible or maybe you've been reading it for years. If you have questions about how does the Bible work, how did it come together, how does it flow, how do you actually read it and interpret it, we would love for you to check it out. It's going to be happening over the next five weeks. And our discipleship director, Corey Hendrickson, is going to be a part of leading it. So we'd love for you to jump in and to be a part of that. So as I mentioned, today we are starting a brand new series called Beginnings where we are going to be looking at the start of the church in the New Testament book of Acts. And last weekend was, of course, Easter. And something incredible that happened last weekend, in addition to celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, is that we had almost 20,000 people come through our doors at all of our Kensington locations. And if you count the streaming, the, the people who streamed, that means the message of Jesus went out and to more than 30 thousand people locally, nationally, and globally. And that's incredible. You can clap for that. And so last week, we celebrated the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. But today, starting today, we're going to be really tackling the question, what happened after that? So after Jesus rose again, he spent 40 days on this earth with his followers, teaching them, leading them, performing more miracles. And then he returned to heaven. But the thing is, is that before he left and returned back to heaven, he told his followers something very specific. And he told them what has happened, this message of what I've done for you. I want you to take this to the ends of the earth. Tell everyone you can. But he also told them, I want you to wait because I have a gift for you. And this gift wasn't a something, but rather it was a someone and it was a gift of the Holy Spirit. And depending upon your experience in church and your experience with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, for some of us, maybe the Holy Spirit is someone that we're very comfortable with. We've heard a lot about, we've received a lot of teaching on the Holy Spirit. Maybe for others of us, we're not so comfortable. And in certain circles, the Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Holy Ghost, which can make him almost feel more mysterious and difficult for us to really understand. But the Holy Spirit is a person. 
and a gift that God has given us to do so many things to help us on this journey. And Steve's going to be up here in a few moments to really be able to lead us in that thought. But before he actually gets up here, we actually want to watch a video to help us to better understand who exactly is the Holy Spirit. And this video was actually made by some friends of ours in Zambia, and they're a phenomenal, phenomenal ministry. Nate actually knows them well. And it actually takes statements from the scriptures. Every statement that you're going to see are statements from the scriptures as to who the Holy Spirit is. So let's check this out video out together.
<laughs> you know, coming up into that and looking at Nate and seeing the tears in his eyes and his love for Jesus and and it happened, it happened just now, but in the first service this morning, we're talking about the Spirit of God being here, right? With the, the Kensington family and we're in multiple locations. We've got people watching, people are here. And it hit me as Lachelle was singing that there are literally hundreds of millions of people recognizing the presence of God's Spirit in fellowships all over the world, like tens of thousands of uh, African fellowships meeting under thorn trees in, all, in, in, in outlying regions all over Africa. I was thinking of the, the girls that we've rescued in Nepal and the fellowships that they're a part of that I've sat in where I, I've, I've been in, in a room with a hundred rescued girls all praying at the same time in tears of joy, in tears of sadness, in tears of hope, literally flowing down every single one's face. And you just realize that God's Spirit is moving in the world and moving in people's hearts. Even as people are starting to explore the realities of the greatness and the immensity of God and God is moving in people. And today I wanna to talk about one of the places where that really started in a unique way in the book of Acts. And it's just so great to share it today. And I just want to open with a word of prayer to say, Lord, thank you that you promised to never leave us or forsake us. You promised to provide us with your presence, with, with, with your healing and resting touch and your comforting touch in our life. Even when things are not going right, that we know that you're there and you care for us and nothing can ever take us from your presence. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So cool, man. That was, that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? Just, uh, just so beautiful. It's just, uh, it's amazing. And you know where that happened? You know where that started? That started in Acts chapter two, where Jesus had told the disciples to wait and something was gonna happen. I'll read you that verse in just a minute, but it says in Acts chapter two, uh, a few weeks after Jesus had ascended back to the Father, he said, I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit. He says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And here's the part where I just, this, this whole thing is so cool, but listen, it says, now they were, staying, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. In other, in other words, from every place in the known world at that time. During Pentecost, people, would, Jews who were connected and non-Jews who were connected to the God of Israel would come to Jerusalem on this day, the day of Pentecost. And here's what happened. When they heard this sound, the sound of the rushing wind, People outside, I guess the, the, uh, the Bible series that was done for the History Channel actually shows this image. I haven't seen it, but I'd like to see what it looks like. It says, when they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. As far as we know, this was a one-time event in history where all of these languages, all of a sudden, Everyone who was waiting for Jesus, what Jesus had asked them to wait for, began to speak in unknown languages to themselves that were understood by the people who come to Jerusalem together. And here's what's a riot. It says, utterly amazed, verse seven, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? You're saying, what is a Galilean, a Jew? Like a, a person who would be Jewish, but from Galilee, be north of Jerusalem, It'd be like saying you're from West Virginia or like Memphis, Tennessee. It's not funny. Okay. It's like, it's like country. It'd be like country Jews. People who spoke with a funny accent. It says, how is it 
in verse 8, that each of us hears them in our native language. This word native literally would speak to the fact that everyone has a heart language. For most of us in this room, your heart language is probably English. Like if you're really touched by something, it usually happens in the English language. But there are others in this room. We have up on our third floor right now probably 60 to 75 people that speak the Indian language of Telugu from eastern, more of the eastern, southeastern section of India. And, they speak, and up there, up there singing right now in the Telugu language. It's their heart language. I talked to people before and after this service who spoke Korean, Mandarin. There are people here today who speak Mandarin as a heart language. It's like the language when you're most moved. And so all these people are gathered in Jerusalem and they're hearing the language in a way that speaks to their heart. Parthians, Medes, it's first night, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, which be like Babylon, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, people from Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs. And this is what they said. We hear these country Jews from Galilee declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. And it says, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? I'll give you the answer to that right now. What it meant was that Jesus had sent from God the Father, the third person of the Trinity, who had always been at work throughout the whole Bible, but to then directly dwell in the lives of believers. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has been made available to you. And there's some things that happen in this story that are truly unique. I don't think anyone could fully understand the, amaz the amazement of this, but this is the beginning of the church of which we're a part of. And again, because most of you don't know this, I'll tell you, there are about at least 7,000 distinct spoken, unique spoken languages in the world. 7,000 distinct spoken languages in the world. How many do you speak? I speak one. Do you speak three? Oh, pfft. Well, excuse me. Reuben, Reuben Mariacall, who took over for Julius Murgor in Kenya, one of our partners in Kenya, he speaks nine languages. It is amazing. There are, there are lots of people in the world that do that. It's incredible. But on this day when the church was being born, all of the languages that were represented in the city of Jerusalem that day, everybody there heard the story of Jesus in their language. And on the day the church was born, it's so important not to miss this, the church being born that day, God was saying to all the peoples of the earth, I came for you. Like, I'm, I'm for you. I don't care what your language is. If you're a Cretan or an Arab or if you're from Libya or Egypt or whatever tribal group from around the world in a remote place, Jesus is saying, I am for you. Now, I've got one more verse I want you to think about because this happens. This always happens when Jesus is working in people's lives. It says, some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. They've been, they've been bibbing a little early in the morning. In fact, if you come back next week, or if you're listening online, listen on the stream, all of our campus will be teaching about this. The first thing that Peter does when he gets up to speak to this crowd is he says, we're not drunk. He has to like give this disclaimer. And he says, but you have heard about Jesus in the language that most directly enters your heart. Because Jesus' longing was that every person on earth would know how deeply loved they were by God the Father and loved by his actions on the cross and by the resurrection. And this all took place on the day of Pentecost. Let me go back just for a second to Luke. If, if for those of you that are beginning to read the Bible, the Gospel of Luke, which is one of the four Gospels that tells the story of Jesus, literally just perfectly bleeds into the book of Acts. And in Luke 24, in the very end of, of, of Luke, right before the book of Acts begins, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And it says he opened their minds 
so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Again, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are part of the craziness that we believe that Jesus, by the power of God the Father, defeated death on the third day with the initiation of the Holy Spirit, raised from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you're witness to these things. And he says, I'm gonna send to you what my father's promised, which was, he talked about it repeatedly in, in the gospels, the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm gonna send you what my father's promised, but stay in the city of Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high. And that's the day that it happens. I just love it. There's so much to unpack from this to think about. And I'm, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna even touch the surface of what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to work in people's lives? Because all over the world, I've seen God working in people so uniquely and so differently, so many different expressions and movements. I was, we were uh, sitting uh, at 8.30 this morning before the first service, and Mervette, who's our campus director, she and Andrew were sharing some stuff, but Mervette was just giving us a perspective before we prayed for the people that were gonna come today and for people all over the world. And I thought, what Mervat did was so unique because she's unique and the Holy Spirit working in her is so unique and so unusual. And it says, in this moment, like a violent wind, this sound came from heaven and filled the house. So first of all, I want you to see that first of all, it wasn't at first on the people. It was just like, whoa. Everybody's like, whoa, this is, this is like a, uh, Sam Anderson, who, who was our lead researcher and writer for this message, he said it was like a whoosh and a whoa. It's like, whoosh, like whoosh. Everybody's like, whoa. It's kind of a fun day. And this wind certainly signifies not so much an actual hurricane wind, although that could have been part of it, but the wind was from this word, the Greek word where we get the word panoa, which is the word breath. It's the same thing in, in Genesis 2 where it says God created Adam and then he said and, and breathed into him the breath of life, the spirit of life. It's like the spirit of God was breathed into Adam in creation. That was something that God was breathing his life into us. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, one of the promises, Jesus says, I'm gonna breathe my spirit into you. It's absolutely cool. When this breath is breathed, something changes in our lives. So maybe there wasn't a literal wind, maybe there was, but people were laying hold of the fact that the Holy Spirit, that we were now not operating on our own. One of my favorite verses in the Gospel of John is Jesus said to his disciples, this is before he went to the cross, he said, listen, I'm gonna tell you something, you're not gonna enjoy hearing it. It's gonna be a little strange. I'm paraphrasing here. He goes, without me, you can't do anything. Like with me, all things are possible, right? But apart from me, you can do, in those, you're gonna be dependent on me. The disciples were waiting in the upper room because why? Because they'd been terrified. They had failed in their mission to stay with Jesus till the end. They knew they couldn't do it without the power of God. And when God calls you to do something, he's gonna give you the presence of his spirit. Look at verse three. It says, Tongues of fire separated and rested on each of them. Like there was no hierarchy of the Holy Spirit. You know, like say, well, man, you know, so-and-so has really got the Holy. No, no. God's presence is with you as much as anybody else on planet Earth, if you'd only recognize it. He would call you and work in you in an unbelievable way. This fire that, that is represented throughout the Old Testament, you see Moses in the burning bush or or the pillar of fire that led the Israelites. It was the fire is always a sign that God is present with us. And this presence comes in like wind and fire. It's, it's strong, it's heavy, it's whoa. And then in verse four, it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. This word uh, for filled is pretty cool. The, the, the kind of the verb aspect of this is pimplimi. Pimplimi, it's the, the Greek word. But there, there was something unique I'd never seen about it and I was, as I was kind of researching the, the Greek language this week, which I do sometimes on these. It's not only to fill someone, not, not like to fill something, but it carries with it the connotation of to fulfill something. Like 
When you're filled with God's presence, it's not only to be filled, but it's a sense of fulfillment and completion. It's pretty cool. How many of you walked in here today or been struggling this week in your job or in your relationship and you feel empty? You feel like a hollow shell. You feel broken in relationships with other people and you've forgotten that God has said to you, listen, I'm with you every step of the way. I've come to be present with you. Can you remember any moment in your life where you felt the presence of somebody when you were at your worst moment? Can you ever remember when somebody came up and like you're at a really low moment and all of a sudden someone just gently rests their shoulder on you? Lou, sometimes you come up and give me a hug. It's like, it's like the presence of the Holy Spirit represented through you coming to me. There's something about that touch that's so powerful. And there's two things to see in this. First of all, is that the Holy Spirit is like bringing like an attitude of rest, like you are safe. You ever touch somebody when you felt unsafe? Like you remember your mom or dad reaching out and taking hold of your hand and all of a sudden you feel safe? So interesting with my dad. It was interesting. My dad and I had adventures all over the world. We were in some really tight spots in Africa and in Europe. There were different moments. It's funny. I don't ever remember one moment, even when we had a couple of near-death experiences in Africa as kids, when I was a kid with my dad, I don't ever remember being afraid because my, my dad was there. It was just it was crazy. I sh- looking back, I should have been afraid, but I wasn't. And what God is on this day is saying to the disciples, Jesus, all through the time that he was with the disciples, was all, always telling them not to be afraid. But they were operating in fear. They were afraid to step out in faith. Peg, when when God told you to step out to care for orphans around the world with our no child ministry, you were afraid to do that. But God says, no, I'm gonna give you the power to do that. I'm gonna give you the strength and the energy and the joy to do that. I'm gonna be with you. This is what happened on the day of Pentecost. But not only the spirit resting on them, but beginning to move through them. That's the other part. I got a buddy of mine, Tim Morton. I'm going to bring him up on the stage today just to give you one living example of of, of what it means when the Holy Spirit is just working in a person's life. It looks different in every person. But when God moves, things start to happen. You start to be other-centered. You start to move out. And when the Spirit shows up, he not only rests on you, but he fills you up. You know, it's funny. when, When we were singing earlier today, I thought, I'm, I'm with people all the time that struggle with discouragement or they, 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 they see things that make them feel hopeless. And, and all of a sudden, as we were singing today, as it hit me, I thought, why would I ever be discouraged? There are literally hundreds of millions of people celebrating Jesus right now, maybe billions of people around the world right now, celebrating Jesus and loving Jesus and, and are in fellowship with us from, from every tribe, nation, and tongue, from every denomination group, People love it. It's like we belong to something together, even though we're, and we're, and we're a bunch of ragtag people. We're a bunch of people that make constant mistakes and failures, but we have the presence and the love of God. It's incredible, isn't it? Amen. Hello? Well, two of you feel that way. Good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's so encouraging to me. And I think this is funny to me because it says that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began speaking in other tongues as, a, as the Spirit enabled and it's interesting when the word tongues, this word gloss is literally a physical tongue. And I was thinking of God giving people the ability to speak known languages to other people. Uh, I have two of my four I have two kids, my oldest and youngest, tried to learn languages, didn't do very well. I've got two middle kids that are pretty incredible with language. My daughter Nancy's uh, mo- kind of multilingual, she hears languages. And within a couple of weeks, she starts to be conversant in languages. Pretty fun, pretty neat to see. My daughter, Helen, was a missionary in, in South Africa with the Zulu people for a year with the, with the Zulu uh, leaders, Isaiah and Mercy Mafu, that we work with over there. And within six months, Helen was teaching the Bible in Zulu uh, after six months of study. And it's interesting because in Zulu, it's Kosa language, many of these uh, languages are similar. You say, uh, you have the same word, but you say it with a click 
or, or with a, a blowing out breath out of your mouth, or you say it regularly, and, it, and each, each time it has a completely different meaning. And Helen would describe teaching the Bible to these people, and she'd make a mistake. She'd put in a click when she, would, she, when she should have breathed, she clicked, and when she should have said the regular word, she did something else. She said these high school kids would just fall out. They'd just fall on the ground laughing because she'd say something inappropriate when she was supposed to be telling them about Jesus. But on this day, as they begin to speak these languages and the Holy Spirit is resting on them equally, and again, later you were going to find out the, the gifts of the Spirit were beginning to be evident through all these people, is that God was bringing the languages back together. If you go back to the beginning of the story of the Bible, it says that the Tower of Babel, they were gathered kind of in a fortress mentality. God had said, fill the land, produce, have children, move out, keep the land from just overtaking the earth. But instead, they were all gathering together. So it said God confused their languages to move them out. Well, on this day, instead of, instead of destroying all these languages, he makes all of these languages have meaning. And I want to tell you something I think about heaven related to the day of Pentecost. I thought, when we get to heaven, we're going to understand each other. But you know what I think heaven's going to be? I don't think heaven's going to be one language. I don't. I think heaven is going to be all the languages. It's going to be amazing. But we're going to understand those languages. Don't, wouldn't you love to speak the beautiful language of French or the amazing complexity of Telugu or, or all of the, the beauty of those? I mean, I'm even open to German. <laughs> I always give my German buddies, because it's such a guttural language, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not as beautiful. Some of them, but all of these languages, we're going to hear them all in heaven. It's going to be amazing. And here's the thing that I want you to see. I want you to slip over to verse 11. This is so cool. All of the languages being spoken, and I want you to see this. The people were all amazed and perplexed. They didn't know what to do. And it says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. It's just incredible. Sam Anderson, he was working on this. He, he was writing all this. He said, this had to be the craziest mind warp that anybody had ever experienced. It would, would have been unbelievable. And now to see that happening in the world. I just think it's a vision of heaven. And I would say when you talk about Pentecost this day and what God did, it was like, whoosh. And it was like, whoa. And then it was like, God, in, inhaling the Spirit working through us, and then activation. It's like you're giving the message, and God's saying, not only, I'm not just doing this for those of you in this upper room, I'm doing this for everybody in the whole world. This is my dream. I think that's what God has invited us to be a part of. And I want you to understand this. This day is not, was not just for the disciples. It was for men and women like you and me. People whose hearts are softened, we're just saying, Jesus, I want you to be at work in my life. Holy Spirit, I want, I want to be available to do what you, you've called me to do. I want to sense your, the, your power and presence in my life. I want you to give me courage where there's fear, and you step out and do that. And so I want you to, I want you to think about this um, today because what I've seen is that God wants to bring the world together with the spirit of knowing that God loved the world so much, he gave himself, he gave his son, that you could know how deeply precious and valuable you are. That message of value and hope and forgiveness and new start is what people are longing for in this world. And it's funny, I, I was thinking back to this. I want to tell just one quick story before Tim comes up. About eight years ago, Don Anderson and I just finished hanging out with 300 pastors, Telugu-speaking pastors in India. And I wish you'd been there because I gave some of the worst messages that I've ever given it was like, I was so bad the first day I thought Christianity is going to close in India. Like, I, and then the second day I did better. You know, you, those of you who know me, you know, I, I had my great days and my not so great days. But we ended up having an incredible experience there. And when I travel the world, one of the things that I see, there, there are things I see that strike me. So, for example, I've never seen anybody in the world pray like Indian Christians. Like when you're in India... It's unreal. When, 
in China, when I'm connected with Chinese Christians, one of the things I see is they're so determined to bring the message of Jesus to the whole world. It's like the Chinese just have this passion to go. When I'm in Africa, the th- the, one of the things that stands out is, is the singing is so, like you can be in the remote, most remote area of Africa and the singing is just transcendently beautiful. It's amazing. So you go to the places in the world and you just see the uniqueness that God has made people groups and languages and movements. It's just, it's incredible. Well, on the way back from that trip to India, Don Anderson, who's our global partners director at the time, he goes, hey, I, 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 want, I want you and I to swing by Kuwait City. I'm like, Kuwait City? I don't even, what, what are you talking about? I mean, why Kuwait City? He says, well, I, there's a church there I want you to see. I'm like, okay, whatever. We're going to spend one extra day stopping in Kuwait City on the way home from India. So we get there, and I, I, I encountered something that I didn't expect. The Emir of Kuwait, 100 years ago, gave this little piece of property in downtown Kuwait to a church, a group of missionaries, because one of them had connected the Emir of Kuwait's niece that had cataract surgery. It's like 100 years ago. And it had a site restored. And he was so grateful. He gave them this little piece of property. Because you, you can't own it. You can only give it to them for 100 years. And they just renewed the 100-year lease. And it's about eight or 10 buildings. And there was a pastor, a missionary guy, about 30 years ago, had a vision for all the expats coming to Kuwait. So this church, guys, you would not believe this. I, I would not have believed it had I not experienced it in my own eyes. Friday was the day that people would come to church because uh, Sunday was a work day. Saturday was the day for, uh, for Muslim worship in, in Kuwait City. People from midnight to midnight on, on this 24-hour window, this church in these 10 or 12 buildings had services for 24 hours straight. 85 services on that, during that day in 45 different languages and 30,000 people coming from 165 different nations. And they had this open area and different nations were responsible for different refreshments during the day. And on this one day, I literally talked about Jesus with dozens of people from dozens of different nations. It was maybe the best day of my whole life. And I thought, this is what heaven's gonna be like. This incredible diversity and beauty. And what was fun is the English speaking services were the most diverse. Because if you couldn't find your own language, you end up going to the English service. The one service that I was in, I found out later, had 65 nations represented in that one service. And I thought, this is what heaven is going to be like. This is what started on the day of Pentecost because the Spirit of God is moving in the hearts of people. Well, this is what I want you to know. I want you to know that that same Holy Spirit wants to be at work in you. So Tim Morton, come up here. Somebody, uh, Andrew Kim, was supposed to bring me. uh, Oh, you got him? Uh, I was hoping Andrew had forgotten because I was gonna rip. I was gonna rip on him. It was on me. So I'll just rip on you, Nate, instead. All right, come on, Nate Marialki, give him a hand. Thank you. <laughs> so um, three years ago, um, Mike Emerson, a buddy of mine, was supposed to go to Israel with me. He ended up not being able to go, so he grabbed his buddy Tim Martin, this guy right here. By the way, beautiful head. I love that. Thank you. Love your haircut. Spe- thank you. Special. Um, and we went to Israel, 19, guys, 19 or 20 guys. I think we got a picture right before we climbed Masada. Yeah. But uh, we climbed that bad boy. You can see the trail behind the picture if you look. But uh, Tim and I didn't know each other. Uh, he wasn't a part of Kensington. He was a teacher at Avondale. He was, you're just finishing your career at Avondale, right? Pretty much. And um, we became great friends. What I wanted you to do today is talk to me a little bit about the journey. I want to do it differently this service. Sure. Tell me when you, when you first experienced your first nudge of the Holy Spirit reaching into you and you're coming to, coming to Jesus. Um, it probably was um, 10 years into my coaching career. And uh, my spiritual journey had been a, a slow, slow process. Um, I felt like, you know, God was pursuing me a lot. And when I look back, I see a lot of people that he placed strategically in my life that uh, taught me specific things that I needed to know. Uh, but there, there wasn't a moment of surrender. Um, I was more a fan of Jesus than a follower. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I felt the nudge to, to, to get out of coaching and to be not called coach. Which, which was crazy because you'd, you'd won a state championship at Avondale. You really, in terms of, you were having a great impact on young athletes, but, yeah. but God was telling you to do something different. Yeah, there was a, I call it a feeling of discontent. You know, there was something, something wasn't right. Um, I'll be honest, I was beginning to doubt my ability as a coach because my level, you know, once you've been to the mountaintop, you, you want to go back again, right? <laughs> and you, you think you're going to be able to go back again and you think you're in control. You think you're the ones making everything happen. And I, I was starting to realize yeah, actually, that. We, we yeah. were talking yesterday. Yeah. Uh, we were laughing because, you, you know, it's so funny. Every time I think I'm in control of anything, it all just, yeah, it's, it's so humbling. Yes. And uh, I think the Lord said to me, you need some humbling. You need to be not called coach, so you need to step away. So I resigned and uh, instantly created margin in my life. Uh, my beautiful wife, Vicki's over there, and uh, she really appreciated that because now I could be there for her more. I could be there for my, my children more. I had two daughters that were growing up. And, uh, you know, we just started going on this journey uh, together. And, it, and I still hadn't surrendered yet, but... But I, but I knew there was something greater. There was something more. One of the things that I saw that is you talked about this, even though you didn't know what God was doing, there was something in your, where the Holy Spirit was just kind of opening up your life yeah. to receive or be, or be open. Yeah. That's a moment that happens like for almost everybody, right? In a different way. Yeah. And for me, uh, I had a youth, I had a pastor, associate pastor uh, at a church and he, he's the one that really opened my eyes to what grace was and what true grace was. And uh, it's so counterintuitive to me because I was an athlete and achieve, you know, achievement was part of who I was. All about and competition. It was all about winning. performance. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and grace has nothing to do with that. Mm -mm. And uh, so once I, once I got that in me and it started working in me, then I realized there was, there was something more that I had more value than just my performance. And uh, so that led me to, to do some mission work. And uh, we took two trips to Alaska, which was amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I delve into sports ministry for By the first time. By the way, time. who's up for a mission trip to Alaska? <laughs> yeah, I am. Okay. Beautiful. Jay Lucarelli, if you're listening, let's see if you can organize it. And, and by the way, Mike Emerson uh, later took me back to Alaska for a week. Amazing man. But, fun. But yeah. anyway, um, so while, while we were there, I, I started to learn what it meant like to live for others rather than myself, to serve others rather than myself. And, and anybody's done mission work, and I, I've been to Haiti six times also. And Haiti's been an incredible part of our story yeah, and, and impact on me. And, and uh, you know you go there to serve and, and then you end up being served, mm -hmm. right? You end up seeing faithful people who are so reliant on, on God that it just it impacts you in such a way that it gives you a perspective like nothing else. Yeah. So that kind of spurred me on my journey to, to think about sports ministry. And uh, I was thinking about doing that on my own. In fact, I, I started a small sports ministry, got introduced to FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, in 2011, uh, along with some other men. I, I became a huddle coach, uh, loved what FCA does. Uh, their mission is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ and his church. Hmm. And to me, uh, that's discipleship, right? And so I got to be in a, a discipleship situation with young athletes, including my daughter, and uh, got to experience that. It was, mm -hmm. it was very impactful in my life. And, uh, um, but I did not see myself on FCA staff by any means. The Lord called me back into coaching in around 2013 uh, by a total act of God. Principal came to me. Uh, I wasn't thinking about coaching at all. Didn't think I was going to be coaching again uh, at for boys varsity level. And they had just fired the coach with four <laughs> games to go. And they came to me for some reason and thought I was the one that was going to save the day. Uh, after not coaching for six years, not knowing these players, not knowing the schemes. Not, and uh, I took that as a sign. Tim, there's another opportunity for you to profess what I've been doing in your life to others. Yeah. That you're not that former coach. You, you're a different person now. Um, but I need you to lead these young men and their families. And, uh, man, I dove right in with the permission of my wife and my family, and it became, a, <laughs> thank you, it became a ministry. Yeah. And uh, a little bit later into that career, around 2017, I got um, introduced to the leadership of FCA Michigan. Yeah. And um, so here's where the two-by-four comes in. Okay. I was, they were recruiting me to be on staff, um, 
and I was like not about it because I had my little sports ministry I was doing. It was, I was really comfortable. I was in a safe place, you know. and In control. In control, yeah. I thought. Yeah. And they wanted me to step out and become a missionary and uh, fundraise for my salary. And I got three years left for my pension. We got a daughter in grad school, one about to be married. And uh, so they hired a new assistant superintendent. And what he did is he went to the superintendent of the district and what they did is they gave me a year off from teaching with the option of coming back. Wow. If it didn't work out. So I had a fallback. They didn't want you to go. They didn't so want they me. gave you they gave you a long rope. Yeah. They gave me a long rope. Yeah. And I, I took that as like, wow, you know, that God is just it's all right there, Tim. All you need to do is step out in faith. And I and I heard it clearly. Um, Tim, how much do you trust me? Haven't I been faithful? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get through this. <laughs> Haven't I been faithful to you your whole life? I've been preparing you for this moment. Trust me. Trust me. And uh, <laughs> I did. And God's been doing unbelievable stuff. Man. So even yesterday, you had an appreciation breakfast for yeah. 65 coaches yeah. yesterday, yeah. affecting probably thousands of student athletes. It was amazing, and I was shaking my head in the back watching it all unfold, and, and, and to be honest with you, Steve, it, it's, this whole ministry is about inviting others in. There's so many different ways to plug in, um, and I'm still building the team. I'm still coaching, and uh, one of my associates was leading the whole event, and it was fantastic. The speakers were amazing. The Holy Spirit was present. Gospel was professed, and... Uh, it, w it was fantastic to see what's been happening. You know, pe coaches coming up, coaches in fellowship together, right? Talking about being a Christ-pursuing coach. And I was just going, thank you, Jesus. This is so amazing to be a part of something like this. Yeah. Um, so, and, yeah. you, know, you know, part of it is, for those of you that have had your kids in sports, you know how sports becomes about winning. It becomes about figuring out how to get on the elite level of some program. It's not about the value of people, right? It's not about the eternal value of people and that, one of the things that you're bringing is obviously compete hard and compete to win, but the real value is in loving, is in loving each other. It's and that, that that you're valuable not based on your performance, but on who you are to God. That's so true. And, and uh, Vicky was there yesterday, and she'll she'll say this is the most powerful moment of the breakfast. We were doing a panel with coaches, and these are some elite. Co I mean, I would consider them elite coaches because they're coaching at a very high level, high school and college level. And uh, one of the coaches had just moved schools. And he moved schools, and we've been mentoring him. And he was so appreciative for us being there for him. So he's moved schools, and he's went from an elite program school to, to really his alma mater. He's really done what I did, and I went back to my alma mater. He went 2-17 and 17 last year. <laughs> now, I know this coach before he went there. He said these exact words. We went 2-17, and 17, but it was the most fulfilling year of coaching that I ever had because I changed my why. It was about loving my players. It was about being present. I brought, my family was into it. My, I was doing it for the right reasons, and I wouldn't have been able to do that without FCA in my life. And he said uh, one of his players at the banquet came up to him, and it was the guy that, you know, the one that got the least amount of time. Yeah. And he said, Coach, and he thought... He's gonna, it was going to be a tough conversation after the banquet where he didn't, you know, he didn't play that much. He thought he was just going to start hearing it from the young man. He said, no, uh, Coach, you brought love back to our program. You brought love back to our program. Oh, so that, that's, the, that's the Holy Spirit working it's incredible. through coaches in amazing ways. Well, man, I'm, I'm just so super proud to be your friend and to see how God is working. And I'm thinking a lot of people here are connected to kids, grandkids, playing sports. I'd love for them I'd love for all of you just to be aware that FCA is out there moving, growing in so many of the junior high and high schools and colleges in this region, and there's some, some great people. But one of the things that I hope you saw it in Tim is it, obviously sports was a big part of your journey and that whole thing, but God was leading you along the way. What would you say to people here, people watching on st stream who maybe their gift is IT, maybe their gift is uh, engineering, maybe their gift is you know, writing creative content for, you know, for advertising. How do they listen? What would you say to listen for the, for the nudge of the Holy Spirit moving them in directions where God is leading them? What would you say to them in closing? Um, 
I would say, you know, God speaks to us in many different ways. He's, he's, it's been sometimes in a still small voice, sometimes through others. Sometimes it's that two by four that I needed. So I think God knows exactly what you need. I think he knows, and Steve said it so well today, that we have a power greater than ourselves to step out in faith to do more for the kingdom. And that, every, that the kingdom of, of God is, is, is a, this beautiful body of uniqueness coming together, unified in the blood of Christ for one reason only, for that one that doesn't know him. Mm-hmm. And that becomes your purpose. So wherever God's placed you, however he, he has gifted you, right, in order for you to say yes to that, I feel like you, you need to have spiritual disciplines, you know, you need to be grounded in prayer. You need to be quiet and listen. And sometimes that's through others. You need to be in his word because the power of his word, as Steve showed today, comes through when we read it with intentionality. And then you need to surround yourselves around like-minded people who are doing what inspire you, that, that you're inspired from, but don't compare. Yeah. Don't compare. It's the, the curse of comparison is what stops us from moving ahead. Be the best version that God wants you to be mm-hmm. and follow his lead, and it will work out. Oh, my goodness. Okay, that was worth, that was worth coming for today. Tim Martin, you guys. Um, you want to speak on that? That was unbelievable. Yeah. Move out on that. yeah, let's do it. There's one other thing that I wanted people to be aware of. It's just so exciting. Yeah. Just another thing is we've got something coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um, for, for Kensington, anybody that's involved with Kensington that's a coach or even outside of Kensington, we're going to open it up. Uh, we're going to have a workshop which uh, will go through uh, the framework that we teach coaches to be more relational, to be a Christ-pursuing coach. We would love to spend time with you. So we have a workshop through the Move Out Network. You can register for it. It starts May 10th. It'll be Tuesday evenings from 7 to 8.30. It'll be hybrid, online, in person. And I would just love to meet you, spend some time with you. It's going to be interactive. We, we want you to leave with a transformational purpose statement, a mission statement that you can go and live out. And we want to create a community of coaches because I, I think what's lacking is coaches coming together like mine. I saw it yesterday. Mm-hmm. Coming together, supporting each other, sharing ideas, sharing strategies on how they build relationships, how God's working in their lives. Because I don't need to tell you how important the role of a coach is in today's culture. It's unbelievable. It's huge. Yeah. So we would love to see you. Okay. Love you, man. Thanks. Thank you. The, um, the band, band, band can come on out. Um, we went a little long, but I'm telling you, go back and wa- watch the stream. Oh, just his advice at the end there was, my goodness, that was golden. But I want to say, uh, I was at a micro soccer game, four-year-old soccer game, uh, not too long ago. And I was watching these two dads just scream at the kids, scream at the boys and the girls. And I thought, they need Tim's coaching class. My goodness, it's, it's like they're already teaching the kids just the whole wrong motivation for why to play. And I thought, there's something so special when Christ starts to come in the way you coach or the way you write your content or the way you go to your job tomorrow. This is part of where God has strategically placed you. So we're gonna wrap up just with a, with a song and, and then a chorus, and I'd love for you to, 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 to take this time for the nudging of God to kind of be speaking to you. I want to mention, uh, we also uh, want to take a second to receive our offering. Um, there's many ways to give. Uh, it's funny, for those of you that are younger, if you get down to the bottom, it says you could drop a check or cash into the wooden boxes. I don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, but there are wooden boxes. If you know what a check or a cash is, you can do that. But um, obviously you can give on, on a text, you can give on our Kensington app. But I want to say this, something happened this morning. Uh, Paige, who's directing the service today, she's awesome and so, so high energy. Uh, she said every, every Sunday when she's here working the, working the stage, there's a guy that comes in every, every Sunday morning at 7.30 and drops off a t- his tithe to Kensington. His wife is sick at home and then he goes back and he... I'm assuming he's watching one of the services on the stream. But I thought, what an incredible honor, I thought, in my life to follow Christ with that guy. I don't even know his name. I'm going to find out who it is. But isn't it amazing that when we are together, the last thing I want you to see about the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came, he didn't just come to an individual. 
he came to a community of people. Because he never calls us to do it alone. He never calls us to go it alone. He calls us to do it together. With our last few moments together, we're just gonna sing the song that is just a heart cry. So let's put our faith together after everything we've heard just to say, Lord, Holy Spirit, we need you. We want you. Would you stand with me as we sing these last few songs together? Let this be our prayer. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us, so come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart bow. When you feel the room, you're here and I know that you're moving. I'm here and I know that you'll feel me come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart bow. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. Here and I know you will feel me. Oh, I know you will feel us. Ooh. And the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us as the spirit. This is our faith. This is our prayer. Holy Spirit, come. 
Nothing can compare You are living home Your presence, Lord Lord, I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves When my heart comes free and my shame is under Holy Spirit in your presence, Lord. In the last few minutes, let's just make this our, our prayer, our cry. We sing. Let's just reverently say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here in this place. It changed the atmosphere on the inside of me. Together as a community, this is our heart. One more time to sing. Sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Oh, Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you that all of us today can open our hearts and open up our hands and simply say, like, do, do what you want, move, move in us, create in us a willingness to just receive your love and your grace and your rest. And then, and then to be, Lord, just to be available, all of us, to be activated by you, to love the people in our lives, to love the strangers and the neighbors around us, to to just be filled with the joy of your presence wherever we go today, wherever we go this week. And Lord, as your Holy Spirit is working here and among millions of other churches around the world, would my brothers and sisters that are in this room and on stream, would, they, would you just give them a sense of how much you care about them and how, how much your love and safety and security rests on them, that we can follow you into, into death's jaws and we know that you're gonna hold us close to your heart. We thank you for this incredible chance to share this life together. And we continue to look forward to this series. We're gonna experience all that you did in the church and what you're continuing to do here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, before you walk out here, I just wanna say, some of you might have felt a nudge to connect a fellowship of Christian athletes. Tim will be down here. Love for you to talk to him. Some of you might even be called to be a part of his support team, like I was. And because God's doing incredible things there. Some of you might feel the nudge for baptism next week as Andrew's gonna be baptizing people. It might be the nudge to step out into an area of your life that you've been afraid to step into because you've been frozen by fear. And God's saying to you, listen, I'm with you. If I've called you to do it, have the courage to step out and go for it, okay? 
We'll see you next week. Awesome. Thank you.